a community of Polish civilians. The sound of joy and laughter, now just an echo in the past. The footsteps of the children running, playing. The sound of singing coming from the nearby church and the humdrum of chatter of everyday life. Then, an industrial centre where Marconi tested out innovations in radar, a place of work and a place to better our future. Now it's a crumbling, derelict, abandoned shell, a void that's hard to imagine what was. Nature owns this place now, and this footnote of history will one day vanish. So we've actually got the generator room here, everybody. This is what kept this place warm during those cold English winter months. Most of this site was abandoned and left derelict since 1975, 47 years ago, although some areas were still in use up until 2005, at which point it was completely abandoned. It's now crumbling and falling apart. And before long, nature will reclaim it completely. Unless, of course, the bulldozers come in and knock it down, which is always a likely scenario. These abandoned and derelict places often reach a stage where they become unsafe to explore and even though it's now buried beneath a canopy of trees and hidden away in an overgrown woodland there is still lots to see and lots to explore it's a fascinating site with an equally fascinating history. The site is 79 years old and opened in 1943. It has had three main uses. It began life as RAF Rivenhall, then as a Polish displacement camp, and finally by Marconi radar. We will be covering all of its history in this video, but its use as a Polish displacement camp is what intrigues and interests me the most. The reason why is because my grandfather was here 76 years ago.
There has been death here, and it's now eerie silence is just an echo of its past. Welcome to RAF Rivenhall and Kelverden, Polish displaced persons camp. And finally, a site used by Marconi. Enjoy the video and let's explore. Certainly see everybody that this is very overgrown. So we're just exploring some of this incredible sights. So we've got a Nissan hut over there in the distance, just just here in front of us. This is one of the communal washrooms. So in here you'll find the toilets, the showers, and there would have been communal baths as well. So we're going to take a look at that. So, so, so this would have been used by, by all of the families that lived here during that period. Now, down here everybody, this is most likely where those communal baths would have been. Probably had at least three baths here, well, just, just in a row. And a bit of shower. And of course, against this far wall, just here, is where the wash basins would have gone. Got ourselves an old 1950s exercise bike there, everybody. Now in here, these were actual storage rooms and this is where all of the families that lived here would have placed their suitcases and their worldly belongings.
RAF Rivenhall is a former World War II airfield located between the villages of Silver End in Rivenhall in Essex and was built mid-war and was opened in October 1943. It was used initially by the Americans and then the English with several types of aircraft housed here including B-26 bombers, P-51 Mustang fighters, C-47s, short Stirlings and gliders. They all flew from here along its runways which have all but vanished beneath a modern quarry. A short distance walk from where I am standing now. The airfield was built to the Class A heavy standard and it consisted of three runways of 6,000 feet and the remaining two reaching a length of 4,200 feet. The ground support station consisted of these Nissan huts we see in front of us. They are various sizes and the site is located on the south side of the airfield. These support stations were initially used as squadron headquarters and orderly rooms. The ground station also included mess facilities, chapel, hospital, mission briefing and debriefing, armory and bomb site storage, life support, parachute rigging, supply warehouses, station and airfield security. During its use as RAF Rivenhall, the domestic accommodation sites were constructed dispersed away from the airfield. Most of these remaining today converted and in use by local businesses. We will be visiting that site and area later in this video and it includes a memorial commemorating its use by the RAF. The base was closed in September 1946. It was at that point that the site was converted and used to house Polish servicemen released from prisoners of war camps who did not want to return to their homeland or could not. Most of the Poles and their families housed here during that period are from areas of Poland that had been annexed by the Soviet Union. They had no homes. They were refugees. They had been imprisoned by the Nazi regime, forced into labour in notorious labour camps across Nazi controlled Europe. Between 1946 and June 1956, over a 10 year period, this site became a home to those Polish men, their wives and their family. My grandfather, Jan Kuta, was placed here in 1946 and after his incarceration 
in Morbach labour camp, which was a French camp located close to the border of Germany. It was a subsidiary camp that belonged to Natswila Strofov, a camp infamous for human experiments. He experienced horrific things in that camp, including his hands being broken by the German soldiers. Here in England was his chance to put his past behind him and an opportunity to make a better life for himself. He had no home to go back to in Poland. His land had been annexed by the Soviet Union. My grandfather remained here within this community for about four or five years before he finally settled in Malden, Essex, where he began a new life with my English grandmother. During those years, the site has often been known as the Kelverden Polish Displaced Persons Camp or the Rivenhall Polish Hostel and even the Silver End Polish Camp. The site sits in the middle of all these places and many of the Polish families who were resettled here would send their children to those village schools, attend those local churches and even work in and around this area. For the Poles who lived here though, it was known as a boss. The camp was a self-contained world, largely cut off from the sparsely populated surrounding villages. It was tough living, I'm sure. It's a bit dangerous to walk on there, but can you see that everyone? There's an old, there's an old bed, bed mattress up here. Oh, oh. oh. No, I just noticed that right beneath my feet. Can you see that, everyone? I nearly went down. quite dangerous up here actually because it's, I can feel it soft underneath my feet sorry about the um, light there and there's carpet there's a carpet under my feet as well mm. the stairs are carpeted mm -hmm. let's have a little look in here Some people have tried to start fires in here, haven't they? Oh, look at this. These rooms. Oh, oh my god, it 
it's well I don't know everybody that is I've got the chills here this feels really really creepy oh got shivers going down me okay well I'm gonna be brave something just don't feel right in this section oh. It's so dark, I can't, I'm watching where I'm going, and it is really creepy here. Oh, I'm pretty sure my grandfather's with me anyway. Well, not the one that he's not creeping me out, but. Oh, how could you really jump? <laughs> okay. That is really creepy up there. You, mm, did you no. want to take the torch? No, I don't want to go there. It was making me shiver a little bit, to be honest with you. Literally, I didn't even have the camera rolling, same on it. But a minute ago, Peter and I could actually hear footsteps in this actual room. footsteps in here isn't there? It's weird isn't it? And they're coming in here from the other side aren't they? It sounded like somebody walked in but there was nobody there. Everybody, you can actually see. So we've got Bay Free, 
and just over here we've got bay two so each of these bays would have been accommodation for those Polish families whilst they resided here and there would have been partition walls all the way along here so that would have been a room that would have been one of the partition walls Peter you see the other side it's still there yeah yeah so this partition here at the back where you can see those temporary walls are up that's actually one of the bays and that will give you an idea of how big their actual accommodation would have been so this everybody would have been one of those not sure what bay number it is but that is the size did you want to step in there for me Peter? then i'll then we can get an idea of how big their living space actually was so there we go so in there would have been their beds a sofa a sink possibly a fridge and this would have been their small living quarters for well, up to 10 years mm -hmm. it's incredible really isn't it and, and 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 look how thin these actual walls were so you could literally hear people talking in the next room And even the outside walls are really thin, aren't they? Yeah. Do I mean it must have been a really cold, damp place? Single glazed. Yeah, single glazed, yeah. These ex World War II Nissan huts became their homes for almost 10 years. The relative isolation and ready-made camp infrastructure created for these people an illusion of a tiny Polish state nestled within a benevolent but alien English landscape. It was a welcome and largely very happy little world for people who had been through a good deal during the war. Each family had an extraordinary personal story to tell how they survived the ordeals of war, deportation and separation from their loved ones. Between them, the Poles arriving at the camp would have travelled through or fought in an impressive array of countries in Europe, Central Asia, Siberia, the Middle East, India and Africa. Many had served alongside British armed forces. Now it was time to start a new life, either in Britain or further afield in Canada, the United States of America, Australia and even Argentina. My own family branches, cousins, distant cousins, settled in all of those countries, including Belgium, France and even Israel. My grandfather, however, remained here in England, separated from his family who had settled in Bethune, France, just before World War II broke out. They left just before their Polish home in Kamano near Lviv was taken from them. The option of returning to Poland was not countenanced by many, as those who returned experienced persecution from the Polish communist government and in any case most of the people living here in this camp were from eastern parts of Poland which were no longer part of that country but had become the states of Ukraine the states of Belarus, Lithuania all parts of the Soviet Union All right, Peter and I have just found another building over here in the distance okay so we've got another room another building just 
just over here. Oh look, there's something written on. Oh, it's fallen down. Whatever was written, was written up there, has fallen. But we're gonna take a look. Can we get in there? Oh, it's just like a coal shed or something in there. This side. Oh, here's the door. Alright, let's take a look inside this one here. These Nissan huts were affectionately known as Besky Barrels. They were neatly grouped into four sites. Each hut was supplied with electricity and running water. Toilets and wash houses were communal, but nobody seemed to mind for the washing of clothes and hot baths provided an excuse for catching up on camp gossip. The community church was located nearby and it had more than one priest. The church was certainly a hub of this community and brought everyone together. The camp had a co-op, a health centre and nursery. Vital Polish delicatessen products were supplied on a regular basis. On Fridays, smoke and the sound of a bell ringing heralded the arrival of a travelling fish and chip shop. Fish and chips on wheels. It's incredible really when you look at the site today, abandoned, derelict, forgotten about. The place was once a community and from what I have learnt, it seems to have been a good place too and well remembered and loved by the families that once lived here. Many of the adults resident in this camp went to evening classes to learn how to speak English but because the entire community was Polish speaking, it was difficult for them to learn and little incentive to do so. They had everything here to live and were very much isolated from England. This haven was a far cry from the lives they were forced to leave. Behind in those areas annexed by the Soviet Union, for Poles that were brave enough to remain in their homeland were sadly massacred. Many Polish families, including my own, were lucky survivors. It's a piece of history whitewashed and forgotten about. Sadly, there has been a couple of recorded deaths here an unfortunate Polish guy was killed on a motorcycle right outside the camp and an American jet crashed right beside these Nissan huts in 1959. I wonder if it's haunted, if the ghostly footsteps of those that called this place home still remain here. The camp closed 
in 1959 and the land divided between the four farms that had originally lost their land to make this place. Marconi's took out a lease on the majority of it and many of the buildings here. They tested radar for a number of years but eventually shut down in 2005. Since then the place had been derelict completely except that is for the original RAF Riven Hall domestic accommodation site which we will be heading to at the end of this video. What an incredible site, now abandoned, but once a hub of activity during World War II. With our RAF protecting our skies from invasion, the sound of bombers overhead, the noise of army trucks in the distance, then a community of Polish civilians with the sound of joy and laughter now just an echo in the past the footsteps of the children running playing the sound of singing coming from the nearby church and the humdrum of chatter of everyday life then an industrial centre where Marconi tested out innovations in radar, a place of work and a place to better our future. Now it's a crumbling, derelict, abandoned shell, a void that's hard to imagine what was. Nature owns this place now. And this footnote of history will one day vanish. I'm pleased I got a chance to see it, to walk that path my grandfather walked, to see what he saw and learn a little about his life and the lives of everyone that was once a part of this place. Okay, in the far distance over there, we can actually see the second part of that Polish camp. Now that's where the um, their co-op was situated and there was most likely some residential areas over there. I think there was a there, there may have been a chapel over there, a medical centre, and there's still a lot of the original buildings remaining, but the area has now been repurposed as an industrial site and I'll be sharing a few photographs of some of those buildings about now. Thank you for joining me. I send my best and until next time, stay safe, keep well and bye for now. Bye everybody and thank you.